To young people living in Western nations, buying a house in a major city can feel like an increasingly remote ambition. In London, house prices have risen from around 4.5 times the average wage in 1990 to more than 10 times the average wage today. In this interview, I talked to Patrick Schumacher, the principal architect at Zach Hadid Architects, and Rahim Takhzadegan, the president of the Free Private Cities Foundation. We discuss the ways in which urban planning can lead to economic distortions in the housing market, what can be learned from the less prescriptive policies of Asian economies, and how the free private cities model might create a fairer and more sustainable system of urban planning. I started off by asking Patrick about how his experiences as an architect had affected his views on the planning system. Yes, so I'm an architect for a number of years. Uh, I'm working with Zaharid Architects. We uh, aspire to be innovative and we've developed a new approach to architecture, which I believe is congenial to contemporary conditions, which are much more dynamic, fluid, uh, complex urban life processes. So this, I've developed the concept of parametricism, where el all elements of architecture are becoming parametrically variable and adaptive uh, to uh, contexts, diverse and cont uh, complex contexts, and to each other in complex mixed use uh, urban centers and, and structures. So that's where I'm coming from. And um, the frustration has been over the years that in Europe in particular, um, but also in some places of the, in the US, for instance, New York, uh, planning restrictions are very severe and make any innovation difficult. Uh, freezing out actually, not only innovation, but development as such is very much slowed down. We have this kind of strange paralysis where we have the attempt of many people to participate in this urban renaissance and convergence towards urban concentrations, industry hub, knowledge industry in particular, because that's very important for this, for this society where we have you know, um, R&D, marketing, financing, uh, dominating the way we work in the large economy where physical production is uh, more uh, automized but also becomes highly flexible so that innovation can be absorbed by these new technological systems. Robotic fabrication, you can reprogram the robots, but more so you have all this software service where a new version can be uploaded and distributed to millions and billions nearly instantly. So there's an enormous capacity and scope and value in innovative creative work which wasn't the case 50 years ago, where, where there was no capacity absorbed, a lot of innovation. So for that innovation to take place, you need to, in a complex marketplace with many different expertises having to come together, you need to kind of communicate, 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 connect up, meet, and create these kind of synergy processes and collaborative processes in the city. And you can't distribute out into the green field and be in command and control conditions. And for that, the city needs to be highly adaptive needs to allow to uh, build up that complexity and density. And uh, that's what we have been contributing to, but in Europe it's been very, very difficult. So uh, these innovations are not happening. Not only isn't the density allowed, but also there is no entrepreneurial spirit in the development world allowed. Everything is prescribed by bureaucrats. You know, there's, there's land use, of, uh, land use plans which haven't changed for decades. So this idea of finding the best uh, use mixes for a site, that's not possible. If the, if then the use mixes which are uh, determined, uh, if, if there is this kind of, for instance, a, a site is dedicated to residential, uh, which has been recently been hugely undersupplied with scouting prices, then the, the, uh, the number of units, the unit mix, the size of each apartment is highly prescribed. So, Entrepreneurs in the space and also for architects is highly frustrating. Everything is prescribed. There is no competition. There is no innovation. And um, in a way, the competition is only to, in a sense, gaming the planners and knowing and being an insider on the planning process. That's what oh, that was happening, and it's highly frustrating. So we had to go elsewhere uh, with our uh, ideas and innovations, particular Asia, where now um, more than. 80% of our work is in Asia. And we have, you know, we have 500 creative architects working around the world. Um, we have been, of course, also in the Middle East, in, in you know, when, when 
pre-European uh, debt crisis, there was also a lot going on in, in Europe, but now it's really concentrating in Asia, and there we have a lot of uh, opportunities and openness. And that's uh, fascinating, but the, the European condition uh, is really frustrating and lame and and uh, there's exceptions, of course, the city of London with its uh, governance structure being a kind of uh, remnant, if you like, from uh, the the Middle Ages, which was strategically used in the in the in the sixth and seventies when 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 kind of statism closed down everything. Uh, the financial sector of the city of London managed to 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 utilize uh, the city of London constitution to carve out a kind of possibility to, to, to have a very dynamic uh, um, um, city engine, which is now the world's you know, largest financial center. So these exceptional as well, Hong Kong, another place where we actually have some great buildings, is, is, is been this kind of interesting, um, it's an accidental uh, social experiment in freedom, which was a, you know, <laughs> a backwater and, and forgotten part, which wasn't part of the, uh, let's say, uh, Britain going socialist and uh, uh, had a, was a fantastic result there. So, so these examples show me uh, and my experience in around the world is that it's possible to have a dynamic, innovative, thriving city life and urbanism and economic development trajectory, but not with the current political structures. And they are really um, strangling us here. Mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting and, and sad to hear that you're experiencing so many restrictions that you see as stifling innovation. Uh, in a way, that's what um, you know Raheem is focused on over at the um, Free Private Cities Foundation, trying to practically implement or at least come up with a, a kind of blueprint, a concept for uh, designing cities that are much freer in terms of things like like regulation. So. I'd like to come to Raheem and ask Raheem a question about about what you just said. Um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot I could follow up on, but I'd like to ask Raheem um, whether whether you broadly uh, agree with that characterization that we're experiencing a kind of stagnation uh, in urban development due to excessive planning restrictions, and what you see the role of the free private cities idea being in kind of moving us back towards a, a system where more innovative models of architecture and urban planning are possible? Yes, uh, well, I, I believe that regulation and the stagnation are symptoms and not root causes. Uh, and I think uh, there's also um, a kind of faulty dynamism sometimes in place. Uh, and I think the root cause of the problems is really, uh, and, and it's the thing that, that we try to challenge with the Free Private Cities Foundation, is people not bearing the consequences for political decisions. Uh, and uh, not bearing the consequences means uh, that uh, you have all these intended and pretended goals, uh, but there's never a reality check. If they <laughs> really match the reality, if uh, it's achieved what's intended or pretended, or worse, if the contrary is achieved. And that I, I find really amazing, but frustrating at the same time, that most people believe that zoning and regulation is there to enhance the beauty, the sustainability and the affordability of our, of our cities. And it's, it's, it's really incredible. The opposite is true uh, because what this kind of regulation does, uh, and it's really, I think, for the main fault that people do politics as a kind uh, uh, of uh, putting attention away of interest, really pursuing their interests and not uh, being in competition and and having uh, to find innovative means to really achieve goals that people have, uh, but uh, somehow to throw sense into our eyes. Uh, so uh, what is uh, really happening is the contrary. Uh, with this kind of less uh, innovative regulatory approach, you have a great homogenization, which means the zoning principles are fairly similar around the globe and within cities. And that, of course, is the opposite of true beauty. It's you have lack of differentiation, you have a homogenization. And if you have any limits, because uh, in general, I'm not totally opposed to limitation. I'm not totally opposed to people seeking a kind of stability, even stagnation, if you bear the cost of stagnation. But what's really terrible 
is that we believe um, politicians to provide us with progress and with beauty and with wealth and the opposite is true and i think the only way to go there is to bring back the principle of those people who are designing who are taking the financial decisions who are taking the entrepreneurial decisions but the political decisions about the governance as well bearing the consequences when we have the reality check if it's working out or not uh, that way i don't think the free private city foundation is not offering a blueprint for every city on the planet to follow it's offering a way to open up that kind of competition and learning process that's necessary because no one of us no single person even patrick with all his uh, visions he have i i i wouldn't believe that it's possible to have a blueprint for the future already because the future is so dynamic and complex and it's really challenging and we got to learn and we got to adapt in a flexible way and i think cities will have to adapt in a more and more flexible way uh, to this complexity of us living together in a globalized digital world that we live in. Yeah, thank you, Raheem. Um, so we're seeing this kind of uh, these zoning rules and these regulations that are placed on housing kind of affect the aesthetic appeal of, of different districts. Um, and that's something certainly to consider when we're, we're thinking about what the optimum way of, of planning a particular area is. Um, I want to kind of ask Patrick a bit more about about that question, um, because the the free private cities idea is not so much as Raheem mentions, it's not so much about um, prescribing a particular way of doing uh, regulation or doing cities, but it's more about trying to set some very basic principles about the consent between the governed and uh, the governors, people that run cities and the people that live and work in them, and then Kind of allow the market to decide which models work for which different areas and in patrick's um patrick in your in your answer to that first question you mentioned that there are quite liberal systems in the city of london and that you're doing a lot of work in asia so in a context where we had a more competitive um set of governance models uh, it would be good to get your take on on what you think would we would start to see more of what are the kind of key principles that you think London, the city of London does well, or Asian economies do well, or Hong Kong does well, that you think we would see more of if there was a more free uh, market kind of uh, competition between, between different jurisdictions around the world? Very good. Um, we would see more density right. on many levels uh, because we have a um, prescriptive kind of nanny state uh, protections against density, which which uh, are just set absolute. Um, <clears throat> but in particular, uh, we have new new ways of life where apartment might be not need to be that large anymore. When you spend a lot of time out and you have a kind of urban infrastructure with Starbucks and restaurants and cafes and um, many other public lobbies, etc. Um, we would uh, see more. Um, mixity of functions more um, also less homogeneity in terms of typologies and i think that would make the city more vibrant more beautiful more effective for what it's supposed to deliver which is an you know an intensification of uh, collaborative communication uh, you know learning processes collaborative processes and uh, really the problem is that we need more degrees of freedom and that is not only, of course, in terms of the urban entrepreneurs who are delivering real estate, but across the board in, in all uh, parts of economic life. We need much more economic freedom and entrepreneurial freedoms. Uh, but in the urban world, world I would say uh, that, yes, you would be able to um, allow entrepreneurs to discover the co-location synergies which are most pertinent and most value creation and what that means most useful for society freely without having prescribed um, doctrines and plans from bureaucrats who have neither the knowledge nor the incentive uh, like Raheem said they, they don't suffer really the consequences of their of mismanagement and they're incredibly conservative because if you do nothing prevention is always the safest bet that's why 
amazing project, uh, you know, just prevented because you have this culture of protest and nimbyism where some loud voices whose personal interests are effect, affected try to prevent any development. And that, of course, in a, in, a, in, a, in a dense urban environment, there is uh, every intervention might have some losers and winners, but uh, and there is the coordination we shouldn't we shouldn't expect from you know elected officials who are elected every four years by I don't know who because participation in these local elections is minuscule and nobody knows what they stand for and what they're up to and in the end they're they're open to a lot of you know special interest mongering. That's not a system, uh, you know, it has a nice label, democracy, but it's, it's, it's dysfunctional and unfair, unjust, irrational system. So if we need, if I, if we can accept that in some parts of cities and not to the e equal extent everywhere, you would require some collective action coordination, let's say, some kind of uh, curation, if you like. You can, they have the areas where it's good to, to have kind of really a free for all, potentially. Uh, uh, to have also the real discovery process, but then, which is costly as well as, as, as exciting. But then there could be a curation and, and regulation, and but that should be, as, as Rahim has suggested, shouldn't be kind of a general population voting for councillors where, where, where these issues are bundled up with, with, with many others and nobody has the time or energy or incentive to really concern themselves with this, neither in terms of the, the voters nor in terms of the politicians. We need to actually empower those who are really in charge and, and, and who are committed, invested with their time, energy, and resources in this process. So it would be you know, landowner association, developers who would who would coordinate for the, and that would they would do the best coordination for value maximization, which is for all of us as consumers of cities, the best result could be expected. But I also expect in a competitive, um, let's say environment where many different cities can experiment with these ways of governance, you will discover uh, you know, a variety of, of types of cities for various types of priorities. But I, my intuition is that also we will probably, um, uh, I would probably expect that more liberal and open regimes which leave more decision-making power to individuals coming into the market and seeing an opportunity and going for it with a purchase and an, an investment, that this would be probably more successful than, uh, you know, let's say a private city which, which thinks it should have a very restrictive regime. Not that it shouldn't be, uh, you know, possible. I don't want to be prescriptive and dogmatic, but my intuition is, my thesis is, my advice would be, for a private city entrepreneur to test out how much you could really leave to very, to very, very open and free, free process. And that would also be for the architects more fun. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so what you're kind of saying there then is, is that if you have a majoritarian kind of system where these decisions are all made by a kind of nebulous group of people that might not understand the ins and outs, aren't experts, then you tend to get this this sort of stagnation and lack of maximization of value. Um, I mean, we have to we have to expect kind of rational ignorance. Uh, it's not even so interesting uh, all these, these these issues, and it will only be then a very highly localized forces which will be voicing, and that will always be preventive. Um, I don't, you know, there isn't even media. There's no there's no interest really in, 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 in local elections. I don't think that ever anybody participates or knows even what's going on. So that's already uh, from the, from the get-go falls. People don't have that amount of time and energy and interest to concern yeah. ourselves with this. So it's, it's in a way, um, um, we all are kind of silent majority. Mm. And um, it, it isn't even an active majority. It's a silent majority which and special interests and loud voices dominate and prevent uh, the scene. That's, you know, highly dysfunctional. And that nearly has to be disrupted. And the problem is that it has this kind of halo of um, um, 
uh, democracy, which which it's kind of untouchable. <laughs> you can't. It's uh, the the holy cow, which which. But we need to we need to you know strip the, strip off the veil, and look what's underneath that kind of phrase in reality, and that's um, not functioning simply. Mm. Yeah, so I'd like to ask Raheem um, for his take on that issue. Um, so Raheem, do you think that we're seeing this kind of um, these kinds of issues where decisions are made too majoritarian? And what what kind of alternative vision does the free private cities present for the way of solving some of the problems that Patrick's alluded to there, such as the, the kind of nimbyism problem or the problem with special interest groups causing urban development to be suboptimal or, or slowed down? Yeah, I think at the root there's really a big misunderstanding of demo what democracy is or should be. Uh, democracy is considered as something very positive. And I agree that there's really something very positive in this tradition, but I find it, uh, it, is, uh, it has been put to the contrary. Uh, now, originally, even the ancient Greeks with all their faults, they thought that autonomy was one of the essences of democracy and certainly not everyone living according to the same rules. It's living according to appropriate rules uh, because everyone living according to the same rules, of course, means a lot of top-down uh, coercion uh, on people and a lot of dysfunctionality. So you either have failing or uh, crypto authoritarian uh, systems, even totalitarian systems, if you think that democracy is really just majority rule and finding the lowest common denominator, even on a global scale nowadays, because so much of politics uh, is alike. And we're seeing that everywhere. It's kind of, it's uh, seeking a compromise, which is good, but you can only find a compromise if you have people who look at each other on the, on the same level and try to find an understanding as adults. Uh, if you find a compromise in rules and in tools and uh, things that we use, uh, then of course, what you end up with is a lot of destruction. Uh, so I think we, uh, for a faulty and dysfunctional middle ground, we're losing all of the more profound solutions to our problems. Uh, we've, we are seeing a kind of sub uh, that's emerging and not only in city planning but everywhere I think in every uh, field you can see that and, and what is it like it's not dense enough and not dynamic enough to be a real city but it's too dense and too dynamic to be a kind of village or a or a community conception of something and I think there's a place for both of that and I see I think we're seeing in many fields in economics and uh, uh, finance that middle ground this uh, the middle ground taking over and and all the the more uh, autonomous and uh, dynamic and appropriate solutions being driven out uh, uh, by those forces uh, and I think free private cities uh, really takes uh, democracy more seriously uh, in a sense that it's about people living according to their preferences but not just the kind of wishful thinking but according to preferences that really work out uh, and and discover. Uh, and I think for different phases in our life, we may find different matches to our needs and we may find uh, 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 di different arrangements of living together. Uh, and maybe it's even sometimes two contradictions at the same time. I mean, even in ancient times where we had all this uh, amazing city culture emerging in Europe, we had lots of people having their productive estates on the countryside and going to the city for the very dense cultural and economic interaction, the agora, the theater, uh, and so on. Uh, and you basically have a, a small scale uh, urban um, place to live at and to interact. And then you go back to the countryside, which is more village-like uh, uh, country villa uh, a kind of set settlements. And not the thing, because the thing in between is really kind of military settlements that you have, which a lot of identical tens or little houses, one next to each other on the plots. And it all looks the same, like an army, basically. And I think it's the model of the military that has been taken over by politics. And we think that's kind of democracy. Uh, if lots of people are following the same rules, but I say, no, that's the contrary. It's an army of an empire where everyone is more marching in the same direction, following the same orders. And it's a structure that's bound to fail in a complex and dynamic world uh, as we're living in today. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Raheem. So 
yeah, there are lots of possibilities from the from the free private cities model to to change some of those those problems. Um, but as Patrick alluded to, we do have some uh, key differences in the way that cities are planned around the world and what the regulations are. Um, and I'd like to turn now to something that Patrick mentioned again. It was it was during the first answer, but. Um, you said that 80% of the work that you're doing is now in Asia. And I wanted to ask Patrick, um, what is it that's being done differently in Asia? Um, I've, I've just spent 10 years living in China, recently returned to the UK. And people will often talk about China or Asian economies as if they're these highly like authoritarian, but efficient authoritarian states. And I think the picture is much more complicated that there are certain ways in which there is a more status model in Asia. There's more kind of control of the media and more control of politics. But in other ways, like urban planning might be a good example. Uh, it seems that there's much more freedom at the local level to to build new things and experiment with ideas. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what your perceptions are of what's happening in Asia and kind of what they're doing well, what they're doing less well and um, what kind of lessons do you think there are that can be learned in, in the places around the world, particularly Europe, you mentioned, where you feel that things are stagnating more? Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's, it's the thrill. I mean, the culture in, in, in Asia and in China in particular has been amazing. So the entrepreneurialism, because if you have this land of opportunity open up, it's like the American dream all over again, which is kind of dying away in, in most of America, except in maybe some special in um, the software industry clusters. So that's the way it's thrilling. You have this entrepreneurship, you have all these startup companies and, and, and they're highly competitive, but there's also a lot of freedom and uh, economic freedoms to, to build firms, to build companies, to make connections, to bring in, of course, also knowledge uh, and ways of doing things from, from the rest of the world. And then there's also a fantastic amount of urban entrepreneurship. And yes, it's, it's government is involved, regional governments, but they're very experimental, they're very competitive, and they're, 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 they're risk-taking in a positive sense. And, but this is, of course, in, a, you know, in an overall environment where you have kind of used to have 10%, now 6-7% growth, that helps a lot, of course. And, but it's also infectious. So, so if you go into China, you every meeting could be people from diverse backgrounds they immediately come together to to plot projects ventures <laughs> investments uh, or you know uh, collaborative ventures i mean it's exciting it's a thrill and for that you need that uh, the opportunities need to be there and yes i think that that um one could hope and wish that there was the state was withdraw more there's still a lot of uh, control, but you have fantastic sectors, which were in, in, in themselves very competitive. The whole IT sector, all these fantastic companies um, and products, which are now overtaking and leading Western, even American uh, companies. I mean, we work with some of them in the in the in the area, of course, of 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 uh, digital services. We're, we're talking about Tencent, Baidu, Oppo, many of these fantastic companies, and they're 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 expanding. And they have exciting research projects, you know, and that's a world where we we interfacing as well. There's all of these uh, knowledge industry incubator cities and districts, which have been uh, which are, are emerging and also open for 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 foreign and West, uh, Western uh, influences and companies to to come in. So so it's been thrilling. Yes, there is um, there could be more. Um, um, you know, when, when things become larger, the government gets more into it and they're a little bit over cautious with, of course, with the freedom of communication. I think that there are issues there as well, as well but the overall is, is, is really thrilling and fantastic. And it also shows in the art world, which is very kind of thriving, uh, the architecture world, design world, the cultural world, there's a lot going on. Yes, there is some censorship, but how could you censor it all? I mean, this is, there are certain sensitive issues um uh, maybe one stays away from but every, there's there's a lot of uh, thriving and i would say we have that potential of course it's you know the kind of sclerotic U european race uh you know if if you know look at the cryptocurrency kind of 
scene and culture and ecosystems. It's thrilling. I mean, this is that dynamism, and that entrepreneurship, because it's a space not yet under the kind of uh, encroaching uh, uh, leaden hands of, of, of the state. Uh, there and of course there's this kind of black cloud will they come in will they uh, prevent us with maybe stops the energy uh, you know in anticipation but the energy is amazing and uh, you can see uh, all the young people and entrepreneurs and, and bright and smart and fast learning and sophisticated challenging the states challenging big business the banking systems that uh, all the legacy systems uh, in a very very smart and sophisticated way so so it's possible everywhere and you can see that space of freedom it unleashes uh, these energies. And I think that's that's so wonderful to see. And I want to generalize that. I want to have that in, in, in urbanism and in economic development, uh, you know, uh, more generally. And I think it's tragic that and we have to have that open discussion about what democracy means and what it is based on and what, what it shouldn't mean. And uh, that's very important. And uh, not only for, for city development, for, for the development of this civilization, that global civilization, which uh, which is really tragically paralyzed by by the wrong politics. And I think the private city movement is is, is fantastic um, um, movement, which which has also a lot of energy and particip participants. Unfortunately, we have we have to look for opportunities away from the heartlands. Uh, you know, in, in 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 kind of distant places like like Honduras, for instance. So um, and and that's. Uh, that's a shame. It would be we really have to have that discourse that these opportunities also open up in the in the in the heart of, for instance, Europe, the US, etc. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. You mentioned there the role of cryptocurrency. And of course, in many economies, I mean, you're you're calling from the UK today. I'm in the UK. This this economy in particular is very the monetary system is so um, dominated by housing, you know, people taking out mortgages and there's this sort of kind of obsession in this country with housing. And it really does shape the way that our urban environment works and um, creates a lot of incentives regarding how people invest their wealth and how people choose to choose to save and earn. So um, I, I wanted to ask Raheem, you know, what, whether he thinks uh, what, what his views are on um cryptocurrencies and uh, you know bitcoin in particular where we where you see um that going and how you see it affecting the um you know the shape of cities and how cities are are being planned and and designed in the future without the kind of dis the effects of central banks um channeling uh channeling money into certain kinds of projects yeah, there really are two very different uh, problems uh, here mentioned. The one is the cryptocurrency sector is a kind of frontier, of course. So I totally agree with Patrick that we see this energy of the pioneers uh, and going somewhere because there's uh, no one, uh, no obstacle or not enough obstacles there doing that. Uh, and I think a lot of the Asian dynamism is a kind of frontier of economic development. It's not really something new. It's very old lessons learned a very hard way in Asia. Uh, and we've seen colossal failure in Asia with, with a huge price and, and, and blood and wealth lost uh, and still learned in a hard way to become a bit more pragmatic, to learn to be courageous to fail in the small scale so that you don't fail in the large scale. And in Europe, uh, our problem uh, potentially is that we have too much legitimacy and wealth in the institutions. So there's really no need uh, to innovate and there's not this uh, frontier and pioneering spirit. Um, and it's lulling Europeans in this idea that we are living in the best possible world already. We've achieved by our institutional greatness, eternal peace after the Second World War, which is really crazy if you look at the history. I mean, you have this total destruction and then really just uh, uh, the young guys are dead and the energy is gone. Uh, and then you have a Pax Americana uh, for a while, and you think that it's something that you've achieved as a great dynamic, innovative achievement in the sense. No, it's really uh, you're ossified in telling yourself that you're the best and everyone has to learn from Europe, which I think if you look in the history is true. There's a lot to learn from Europe, and but the Asians have learned. And that's the interesting thing. Of course, the Asian miracle is an offspring of Europe, but it's a very authentic fusion of 
learnings we had in Europe of institutions or the better kind of our institutions, uh, in particular the British legal tradition and so on, and, and the spirit of autonomous cities, which is very, uh, very important for European history. Uh, and that taking authentic roots, using the energy of the people there, which still want to improve, want to develop, are eager for progress and are eager for a world in which their children will have a better life. And if you ask Europeans, most say nowadays, no, we're pretty sure we know our children we have, will have a worse life and the children of our children will, will have a worse life than we had uh, after uh, in those decades, in these peaceful decades after the Second World War. So on the one hand, we have this kind of pioneering frontier where we really need to learn and we can see the value and hopefully uh, leaving that space open as much as possible for the innovation to happen. Innovation always means that a lot of solutions are wrong and will turn out to be failures. But for those little things, maybe they aren't there yet, for those little things that turn out to be real innovations, we really need that kind of challenging instability and dynamism, not being sure, which we see in the volatility of the Bitcoin price, of course. No one is sure if it'll be gone tomorrow or if it'll be an, uh, 10 times, 100 times as important tomorrow as it is today. Uh, so it's this kind of volatility, which, which people, I mean, if, we, if they feel that they have more to lose than to gain from change. Of course, they don't like that kind of volatility. So they want to protect themselves, but it can't in the long run. And then there's a second uh, aspect of that. And that's, uh, I think the core of your uh, question uh, is indeed real estate has become a financial asset due to the fold of our principal financial assets, which is money, which has been greatly distorted and the whole financial sector of derivatives of, of bonds that have been monetized and are not really uh, a kind of interest bearing instrument anymore. So people are pushed into more and more different assets. And thus you have the kind of regulatory legitimacy of regulating real estate because it has become a major financial asset is all about people losing their livelihoods and so on. And uh, we have the same uh, nonsense that we have in all other financial industries, which is a collusion between regulators building up cartels of lots of people in suits earning lots of money without really offering something new and innovative, uh, just making use of the Cantillon effect. Uh, and this Cantillon effect, uh, uh, which is uh, we wouldn't need nowadays, I mean, uh, historically, cities were also, unfortunately, centers for political total totalitarian structures and redistribution. So you had the granaries, you have the temples and everything, the centers, the pyramids at the center of a system of redistribution. I mean, nowadays, it's basically just ledger entries that are redistributed. So you wouldn't need that. But unfortunately, we still build our central banks in cities. <laughs> and uh, that's why a lot of the city development is distorted, bloated, kind of not really following the preference of the people, but due to the Cantillon effect, uh, producing bogus wealth uh, and thus uh, creating all those kind of uh, real estate getting more and more expensive without really having the returns, without having entrepreneurs who figure out how to make best use of city space, uh, how to have sustainable productivity in the city. No, it's really, it's just there and it's dense and it feels dysfunctional and it feels like a rat race of the people who are pushed out of the cities into suburbia um, uh, and, and so on. And, and, and that's crazy, uh, I think. And it's really at the fault is the kind of monetary system we have, the kind of financial system. And it wasn't planned that way, but it ends up affecting everything, every asset class or everything that could be an asset class like old cars, like antiques, like watches, uh, a whiskey, wine, everything you can think of, which has a kind of store of value, which is not an immediate consumption good, gets distorted in the same way. And that, then again, we have this interventionism as politics in the first place that creates the problem, but it legitimizes politics as a kind of bogus solution to the problems that are created in the first place by politics. And I think a lot in city development is really urbanism is an effort to solve problems that have been caused by urbanism, which is really a per self perpetuating model of legitimacy of welfare distribution of status uh, and so on. And we really got to do better. Um, and because cities are that important, it's really important to start with cities here. Absolutely. I think it's, it's a tragedy that 
um, because of the dysfunctional money system and financial system, people are pushed to, you know, non-diversified, push their life savings into the real estate, which which is very bad for labor mobility, by the way. Yeah. And you're kind of locked in and to flip, you can talk about flipping houses, but it's a difficult and long, takes a long time, highly, highly expensive process. These are highly illiquid uh, assets and very risky assets after all, because they depend on that politics, which might not be, be there forever. So so it's, it's, it's really tragic, but it also means lack of mobility, freezing up the city and freezing up labor. Uh, uh, mobility and and so it's it's really a burden on 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 progress and prosperity that we have that I mean I can understand you know that you might want to live in your own home that's there's something nice about it I'm not saying that should never happen but the way this kind of becomes an obsession and um, uh, and and the kind of existential necessity nearly. Uh, and then you have that red race with, with rising prices uh, and, and it gets harder and harder to, to, to step onto it. And it's really one of the factors which mean that we have that increasing inequality, unfair inequality across the generations and across assets holders and workers, where you have this continuous money pumping, flowing into these asset bubbles. And you, you, it's, it's really tragic and wrong and false. And I agree with Rahim, it's, it's generated through politicians who then kind of pose as, as those who, who fix it. But this just, as Mises said, is this just interventionalist spiraling, spiraling up, then they're coming in with, with you know, with, with controls and price controls and, 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 and positions and redistributions. Now in London, uh, you know, 50% of all new uh, development has to be, uh, residential development is earmarked for political distribution, and that's 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 insane because uh, um, that means for those who cannot rely on these hands, or for them it becomes ever more harder. That is just put on top of for them their burden, and it's a very unfair and opaque, by the way, redistribution. But it's now fifty percent of all new real estate, and and it doesn't help. It makes the matters worse because it further increases prices that whole sort of affordability system is good for those who get a windfall but it also demobilize them but it makes the whole matter worse for everybody else who isn't on that on that lucky uh, list um it's 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 really a horrible system and needs to be exposed but what i experience is once you it's one of the holy kind of cows and grails if you start touching and talking about it, the uh, you know they all they come and get you. They they come to get you. You 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 being cast aside. You've been uh, you know you know uh, stoned and quartered by by some kind of media mob. It's it's tragic. It's very dangerous to talk about this, by the way. But it has to be talked about. It is it's it's really bad. So I made this venture and, and start to criticize uh, the whole uh, social affordability redistribution system and it was it was um, very dangerous for my career hmm. just to clarify patrick that 50 percent figure you mentioned um is that in a particular country and how does that how does that it's manifest england. it's in london in particular i mean uh, it's a, it's the guideline by the mayor of london that's the, that's the aspiration for all borrowers that you have to, uh, if you build a development, you have to, 50% uh, of that is not in the free market distribution is, is then allocated by the borrower. As some of it is social rent. So basically um, only eligibility are those who have um, basically be uh, below minimum wage. So uh, people in no work or uh, irregular, or less than full full work um, on, uh, so they, they get some social rent opportunities, and then the rest, the larger part, is actually distributed to certain kind of key workers, could earn up to ninety thousand pounds per annum, uh, which is which is kind of three times the average income. So it's it's it's, it, but how this is distributed is is very opaque. Each there's no 
universal system, each borrower can have its own list of aspirants. And if you're quick and savvy, and if you if you spend the time and energy uh, on that, you get in there. And 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 but the 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 large the people who really need to be helped and are those let's say in who in in that middle income in that average income um, because these special intermediate housing you need to actually get a mortgage you, you need to earn you know at least double the average income so it's suddenly very skewed uh, you get those who don't contribute and then suddenly a kind of cream cream group of so-called key workers or uh, maybe, maybe it's uh, people who are already privileged to public sector jobs they then get these 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 gifts and uh, that means those who are uh, houses who are still in the private market are ever more expensive because they have to absorb those uh, subsidies into the price of the of the new um, of those who still have to you know buy or rent in the in the private market and that's the people who you know I was talking about uh, the staff of Zadinaki days all the young professionals who come in and you know work out and have to be in the center they're the ones who then end up paying 80% of their income on this kind of accommodation, subsidizing their superiors, their elders, and those who are doing very little or nothing. So, so that's, that's a, it's a very skewed system, very unfair and, and, and very opaque, but it has all the kind of rhetoric surrounding it so that criticizing it becomes a you know, highly um, um, difficult difficult venture and very risky venture unfortunately there's so many vested interests so it's a really bad system and yes it is aspirationally 50 percent but then there is uh, ways of negotiating that because and you get a lot of planning the rules aren't fixed there's this a lot of discretionary powers with the planners and then if you know them and their particulars you and and you then hope to be able to negotiate and make your arguments with a group of consultants it's very corrupt in a way and and the process which also takes a long time and years and if you think you can do that you know to do that then you are able to bid for that site maybe a bit more and then you try to um um, um game those those, uh, those political routes you know that on the product side you can't do actually absolutely nothing to to improve that's all pre-given and you compete on these um let's say insider tracks it's a very unhealthy system i've seen it and it leads to a lot of finally also frustrations everybody who's coming in from the outside into london to invest they've burned themselves uh where they didn't fully understand what's going on and how difficult it is and they in the end gave up whether it's asian um, pension funds or, or middle eastern investors we had a fantastic project, which was in, in the planning process for over three and a half, nearly four years. And then in the end, with, with the, the change in economics, it was then too late and they were no longer investing. And there's so many examples of big sites in the center of London sitting undeveloped um, and the, the hoarding fences around it because some councillors uh, feel kind of empowered to, 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 to place verdict on this, and if, if you read these statements which reject or postpone or send them back to the drawing board, you know, it's two or three pages uh, relative to, to, to kind of year long, several year long process of, of planning, designing, and, and economic planning, it's, it's scandalous. Wouldn't stand up any kind of real scrutiny, but these things are not much discussed. So it's really, really, dis, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if I should call it corrupt, but a very dysfunctional system. Uh, which which we which we need to overcome and and uh, open up and the market would deliver I believe um, a, a very much more um, uh, livable product. Also, the the, the uh, I mean the other lie in the system is that uh, with all this prevention and only allowing this these projects to go forward with this kind of fifty percent for very special groups. I mean. It, it's not that those, uh, you know, um, and preventing uh, products like, for instance, so-called these new co-living opportunities, where you have smaller units, a lot of shared facilities, free shared workspaces and shared kitchens, and they're great projects. The planners supposedly don't like them. They are being prevented. I know of 10 projects in London which are not getting approval 
because supposedly they're exploitative. <laughs> they're not, but the market shows that people want them, love them, and would love to rather go there. And it's the, the, the pretense is that you prevent this, that they, you know, that there's something else they could actually go to. There is nothing else, and therefore the alternative actually to uh, uh, is is what really pe 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 people going in the world commerce underground. They're sitting in in flat shares. Uh, in in conditions which which are which are really um, um, you know not so pretty, that's the reality actually. Um, so anyway, I could go on forever about this topic. The the, the the essence is really we need degrees of freedom. We need the clarity and 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 honesty of market processes. Mm. So so what would be that argument for the fact that these co living Places are exploitative because the the, uh, the units are very small. Because you get a very, but you get tr a truly, you know, uh, individualized personal unit. Maybe with, even, with their own toilet, shower, maybe small kitchenette, but that's only maybe fifteen square meter. And and that then then and and, and it is you know it, it challenges. I, my feeling is why this why they're so hostile against them. Uh, because uh, you have at the same time you have a lot of standards for giveaway, which are much bigger. And maybe if if the private sector shows that you know people who have been full work and and uh, um, can actually happily live uh, uh, in, 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 in 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 much smaller uh, spaces, uh, that that that. You know, uh, it would then expose maybe. Anyway, we'll put a big question mark oh, yeah, on, the, on the on the political distributions, <laughs> which are which are, which are happenings. When in the end, when when those who are kind of in a sense is, uh, financing the system of redistribution, living in conditions which are far less luxurious than those who are being financed, and and the receiving end of distribution, this is one suspicion I have, uh, but. I don't think negative uh, prevention is always safer, yeah. um, and that's that's maybe the the biggest headline here. Prevention in this case is safer, and we've been you know so many projects of us have been prevented as well. But yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's also young entrepreneurs in their twenties, early thirties who are who are who are discovering this um, you know co living idea, and it's 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 great. And it's not only um, uh, economical, which it is, because you, it's, it's in a sense um, um, been learning from student housing. The student housing has that kind of regulatory uh, exception where you can make different kinds of projects, but they then can only be marketed to students. And the, um, and the political argument uh, is, well, because it's temporary, you know, for two years, that could be maybe reasonable, but you can't offer that to the market in general because it's kind of demeaning and unlivable, supposedly. But but that is this this is kind of this paternalism which is so false, and uh, and, un, and and not of this world really. That uh, is 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 kind of then preventing these projects. And it's a big shame because these 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 entrepreneurs also they invest a lot of energy and money and 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 they thought this they could make they, they also can't believe that this is prevented. Now finally the GLA uh, in London has has taken that on, and now but the way they can conceive of possibly allowing for this is by regulating it by taking the kind of the first three experiments. And then, kind of freezing the particular uh, product mix with, with minimum sizes, then an, a necessity of certain services like like linen services, which were minimum amount of you know X Y Z fleet uh, uh, spaces. So they're trying to uh, you know at the point where the market discovery process and that's high idea, of course, markets as, as discovery procedures and, and competitive markets and competition is competitive. As a discovery procedure, you know, the discovery process has barely begun. And I want to kind of freeze it down, and mm. uh, but they haven't done it yet. Still, so so we're still having these ten projects or fifteen projects, which are not happening. It's 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 sad. 
Yeah, for someone who understands these kind of market discovery processes, the idea of doing that does seem pretty bizarre. Um, I but the argument I, you don't you don't get enough you know you, you do the, the argument isn't getting through. There's such yeah. a dominance of um, you know do you get slapped with you know phrases like rabbit hutches and uh, sl new slums. I mean these places I'm talking about they have nothing to do with new slums, but the phrase comes in. And uh, and and I don't know. It's 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 nearly it's a kind of um, uh, it feels like a lobotomized kind of uh, instant reaction <laughs> mm. against that. And it's, it's, this isn't given a chance because it doesn't fit some kind of ideological narrative that the market could actually be a a force for good. A force for trans, you know, which is transparent and 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 delivering, um, you know, and in a sense more democratic than 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 those kind of bureaucratic systems. That's not this inconceivable for certain kind of uh, dominant currencies in the media and a place. If, if a newspaper like the Guardian is very heavy on on the whole issue of of um, the, 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 these affordability crisis and the blame is all put to, to um, uh, you know, they want to get the markets all together out of the business. And in my profession, you know, when you're brought up as a kind of in that milieu of academic left, it's left liberal by the kind of mother milk. And it, it's very, there's a lot of inertia. And if, if that was maybe a, a kind of could have been a, a presumed to be progressive in the in, in you know 30, 40 years ago, but it lingers on and there's no real people have been jerked out of their dogmatic slumbers. So it is automatic and you it's very difficult to break through and, and uh, that's what we're suffering. And then so in architecture you have that as well. It's just uh, you know, commercial forces, market forces are always wrong and bad, and of course it's gonna. And, and, you know, there's really seriously colleagues of mine who, who want to, 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 to think it's a logical conclusion. They say, well, why is it 50%? You know, housing should be 100% taken out of the market. It should be a human right, which has to be politically allocated. Everybody should be, should be equal in their, in their housing. These are the kind of um, um, concepts which, which are, in, and, and, and the thinking which exists in, in this milieu, unfortunately. Hmm. So Raheem, how does the picture that Patrick's very uh, interestingly described in London, how does that compare to what the experience is in, in Central Europe where you're based? I know you work across a number of different Central European countries. Does that tally with the kind of policy that you, um, you experience where you are? Well, the general frame is uh, similar, but of course, London, I mean, as Patrick has mentioned it before, has some peculiarities. So we don't have that much uh, islands uh, of, of city development and financial development, but of course, that can be an advantage in a very distorted time. Uh, so if I compare, for example, Austria and Switzerland, Switzerland tends to become more and more ugly. Uh, and that's very odd because uh, Switzerland is much more wealthy and even leaves more freedom for entrepreneurs. But the reason is that a lot of our modern wealth is of this kind of distortionary uh, nature. It's the fiat wealth, I, I would call it. And it leads to this homogenization of uh, real estate as a financial asset and so on. And, and really lack of innovation there. Um, uh, so that, that's quite interesting. So uh, what makes a city like Vienna, where I live in, as great and beautiful as it is, it, it used to be one of the five biggest and most dynamic cities on the planet uh, already in the 19th century. It emerged, it had a very rapid economic development and it was a center as today, maybe Shanghai, Singapore and so on, of course, at the time. And wealth, if it's uh, wealth based in really productive entrepreneurialism, then it creates beauty out of it because wealth leads to culture. It's people being able to personalize, to find better ways to build, to, to find functionality. It's not perfect. And of course, we already had distortions in the 19th century. And some of those distortions led to a lot of destruction in the 
20th century, but a lot of urban beauty in Europe really is arrested development uh, at a past stage, which wasn't too bad because a lot of the European cities really are focused around the marketplace, are focused around networks, nodes of the very ancient trade routes that we had in Europe, or are focused on a really city autonomy like uh, the, the Italian cities of merchants, of pioneers, uh, going out, exploring the world and bringing back riches and knowledge uh, and ideas to those dense structures that now constitute most of the beauty and attraction of Europe if compared to other more recently developed parts uh, of the planet. Uh, but I've always been a bit sad that as it's an arrested development, it gets a kind of open air museum. Uh, and uh, of course, it's, it's, uh, it feels like an open air museum. Uh, and that's a bit sad uh, uh, because I mean, it's always nice to spend time here and, and, and to consume within those uh, uh, beautiful architectural gems we have here, uh, but it's really not the same as, as being architectures fulfilling an active function of what people really need. And we are not meant to just consume in a coffee shop uh, uh, and, and, and enjoy a nice sightseeing tour. We are meant to interact, to cooperate, to create something new, to risk something. Uh, and that's really what's lacking in Europe. And no, but I think the, just of those the islands maybe maybe survive in Great Britain. We'll see how it do after the Brexit. Uh, of course, Great Britain has a lot of problems, but uh, I'm a bit more optimistic than most continental Europeans that we may see ports emerge, uh, gain in importance. We may see an orientation of the islands towards the west, towards new trade routes, uh, and we may see more dynamism. Uh, in Great Britain before we see it on the continent. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I mean, it is very important to remember that and tell those who are, think that when we withdraw kind of modern planning and regulations, cities kind of descend to some kind of infernal chaos uh, and slum land, that, that the, the beautiful 19th century cities, inner cities we now all you know, rely on still, um, have been created before you had this kind of central planning in and, and strong urban planning regimes. They have been a part of a laissez-faire laissez 19th century, and they've been developed in particular in London. It's interesting they've been developed privately by you know private planning. Yeah. You know the great the so-called great estates, district by district, district competing with district, but also a an an, an, an ownership group, a family, curating the, the synergies and value proposition. And that's the result of the most beautiful central districts of London. And then uh, that was been a bit frozen up. Uh, but then the city of London continued with that, with that incredible dynamism. And it's also beautiful. There still have these old alleys and little uh, historical jewels preserved in, 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 in a kind of cluster of the most you know, fantastic contemporary buildings. But it's all over Europe that that, that case that the planning came on only uh, largely post-war, and you have uh, a, a, you know destruction and the creation. The planners created you know environments which are now destitute. And you know uh, the great libertarian economist Jane Jacobs, in a seminal book, the, the the life and death of the great American cities, is is giving an account, an early account of that destruction process and understanding and celebrating the process uh, which, which led to the, uh, the cities we now love and, and become a model nearly, an unattainable, seemingly no longer attainable model of, of, of urban structures. So that it needs to be remembered. It's a very important lesson uh, to be pointed out. Mm. So I'd just like to end on a, on a final question about where things go from here. So we've talked to quite a bit about what we see as some of the key problems with the way that planning is done at the moment and, and regulated. So perhaps I could ask Patrick, Patrick, do you think, do you feel optimistic that we're going to move to a, a system where some of the issues that you describe regarding not allowing the market processes to work and play their function in serving the needs of people do you think that those are going to be acknowledged and overcome or do you think that we're in a we're in a difficult position and 
we're, we're likely to see more of these kinds of controlling measures um, continue for some time. Well, I mean, there is, of course, a chance uh, to, to develop counter models. Unfortunately, if you have to go to remote places, that's not an immediate comparison and it's just, you know, it's an uphill struggle. So the freedom, you, 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 which is a great uh, fuel there, uh, at the same time, you're, you're remote and disconnected from the, from the centers. I, I would love to see some of that, those models could maybe uh, then feed back and be, be picked up uh, in, 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 more, in the more developed uh, parts of the world. Uh, where we have high densities already, and where you can really utilize that for the next stage of development. I don't know. I mean, suppose I, I, I'm afraid that only a major economic crisis will wake up people out of their dogmatic slumbers and jerk them out of their, uh, uh, you know, of their kind of um, uh, uh, ways, uh, because that's the way we are. We, we, we like you know, continuities and we don't want to think too much about the complexities. If, as long as we can keep living our lives, we will do it. And, but I think we might, not that I wish for a crisis to come along, but this little crisis might come along and we should be prepared so that there's a new, a new articulate leadership on many fronts, not only on the urban development front, but on the um, you know, um, economic freedom systems policy front as well. And I, I think such a crisis, uh, uh, will come and we should be prepared and there the hope uh, lies in what we'll be able to build afterwards because if we have the right systems the right policies and freedoms we can rebuild very quickly mm. as the post you know post world war ii in germany demonstrated thanks patrick so so raheem where does how does that tally with your expectations for the future Oh, just a very brief note with all the energy I'm seeing in the free private city space, I'm definitely optimistic. <laughs> so I, I believe in the reality apart from the constructs of intellectual and I think it may take uh, uh, a longer time, but uh, in a global perspective, of course, I have to correct, I tend to be very optimistic. Uh, as for core Europe, I, I think it's still possible for a generation maybe to have a nice and relaxed life if you're independently wealthy in Europe, if you don't depend too much on the red race of getting income to pay back the credit rates for, for you, the house you're living in uh, and so on. But uh, I think we've reached peak uh, wealth or perceived wealth in Europe and for some it will feel like quite a fall, so what you may call a, a, a big uh, economic crisis as we are. I'm not a crisis prophet, uh, uh, but I think it's in the unconsciousness of most continental Western Europeans, it's already there that we'll see a lot of dysfunctionality of institutions that we perceive to be the world best. Uh, uh, and uh, I think there are some hard lessons to learn, but for the world in general, it's great that we have about, it's about time to start learning those lessons. Brilliant. Well, thank you to you both for a really fascinating discussion. Uh, this conversation is going to be shared on YouTube and we're going to post some snippets of the conversation via the Free Private Cities Twitter account, which is at Free Private City, uh, all one word. And uh, Patrick is also on Twitter. You can follow him at, at Patrick with a K underscore shoe. And uh, we'll be tagging him in, in the tweets that we do regarding this content. Uh, and hopefully uh, connecting with him again in the future because this is a fascinating this has been a fascinating talk and i feel we've just scratched the surface of lots of issues that we could we could do a much deeper dive into so i i'd like to end by thanking uh, patrick and raheem for taking part thanks amazing. So much for, thank you so much patrick i really enjoyed the conversation good to see you guys <laughs>